engineering schools. And uh, he's uh, known for his uh, work first in the uh, speech group uh, at Google, where he first created this uh, amazing uh, demonstration of the power of deep learning and the speech recognition. And currently he is in the uh, deep learning infrastructure group at Google. And uh, I guess now he's going to tell us about vision. Yes. Thanks, Yashra. So, yes, um, as Yashra mentioned, I'm a, a, a recovering speech recognition scientist. Um, as you all probably know, speech recognition is pretty much solved. I don't forget it. Um, I look at uh, the image recognition set for a while. Um, I'm part of the uh, deep learning infrastructure team at Google. We work on providing the, the deep learning tools and we perform research on deep learning in general. Uh, for all the different tasks that are uh, of interest uh, to Google in general. So, um, what's happened in vision and in object recognition in the last couple of years? Well, um, we have one really big hammer, and uh, you might all have heard of it. Uh, this is basically a big model that uh, was put together by Ilya Kuchewski, uh, Alex Kuchewski, sorry. For that, uh, Bill Ilya and uh, Jeffrey Hinton um, that basically started a new sort of uh, uh, thrust in object recognition and a new, uh, new era, if you will. Um, there's been, in fact, many brands of hammers that have developed over the last few years that are variations of the theme. There's a uh, board that's going to be presented here. Um, but basically, the main architecture, the main concepts are, are similar basically very large convolutional networks. Um, thankfully, we have a lot of nails lying around, uh, both at Google and in general in computer vision. Uh, so just to mention a few, the things that we're interested in are things like image search, image labeling, segmentation, object detection, uh, object tracking, OCR, and things like this. Um, the very interesting fact uh, uh, about convolutional nets in computer vision is that they have been shown to work extremely well in a wide variety of tasks, They're very much in a task kind of way, provide very solid features. There's a fun paper that came out recently, um, basically taking some of the shelf convolutional net features, applying them to a wide variety of tasks in computer vision, not just object recognition, but um, a whole series, and showing that really those kinds of features and those kinds of approaches really work robustly across the whole spectrum of tasks and have a very good uh, baseline to compare any other task against. Um, I'll mention a, f a fun one. Uh, this is the task of fine grain classification. So if you know object recognition is determining whether you know the you have a, a dog versus a car, uh, the problem of a fine grain classification is determining amongst you know you have a dog and you're trying to find the dog grade, for example. So it's often considered a different task because you really have to look at uh, problems at a different scale and look at the details of the, of the problem. It, and uh, there's a bunch of tasks that are uh, focusing on this. So imagine that you would want to enter this uh, fine grade classification challenge. You had a few days to go before the deadline. Um, you have when Alex uh, trains next lying around, what would you do? Um, the first thing you might want to try is just chop up the top of your uh, convolution uh, network and just take the data that's out there uh, for the, that's provided for the challenge, just train the network with that data and submit that. And because you might be a little embarrassed about how easy it is to do that, you would do so at the ministry. So I'm not going to out the people who did this. But if you did that, you would actually end up being second place on that challenge. The most simple thing you can imagine um, doing based on the assumption that transfer learning from a pre-trained image net uh, model actually does extremely well uh, comparing to, um, to other alternatives out there. So it's a really solid thing. All right, so I'm going to talk about two main avenues here, two main, uh, two, two main things. Uh, the first one is how to build better hammers faster and how to, uh, the main issue with convolutional networks is that they can be very slow to train and it's very difficult to scale if you try to scale them to uh, larger to amounts of data. Let's talk about um, speeding that up. And then I'll, I'll try to 
give you a few examples of things that go beyond what the standard model is and to try and improve things beyond what the state of the art is uh, right now for the, the variety of tasks. So, making a training convolutional nets. Um, one way to approach the problem of training convolutional nets to make it faster is to try and parallelize the training. That's been a, a subject that's been well researched uh, in recent years. A lot of people have looked at it. Um, there are roughly two ways you can go about parallelizing uh, neural network training. One way is model parallelism. You take your neural network, you chop it up into pieces, you put pieces on different machines, and uh, you can take advantage of the many cores that are on the multiple machines to train things fast. Um, the problem with model parallelism is you pay a penalty of communication between machines. You have to exchange uh, on the order of batch size times the number of edge nodes in your network, and that might actually slow down uh, your training, but on a, in exchange for that, you get many more cores. The other way to go is to do data parallelism. So instead of chopping up your model into different pieces, you copy your model onto multiple workers. Um, you then have the different workers work on different subsets of the data. And then the problem comes that you have to synchronize somehow the parameters of the model uh, between the different workers. And one way to, you can do this is using this concept of a parameter server, which is basically a, a, a orchestrating the, 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 the delivery of parameters to the different workers and synchronizing them together. Um, you then have to exchange between the different workers uh, on the order of the number of weights in the model. So you, again, are paying a penalty in terms of uh, communication. Um, we've implemented something like this that does both. Basically, we have a system that is distributed that as model workers that are also distributed and sharded uh, with different uh, subsets of the model, so you can do model parallelism and data parallelism at the same time. The way it works is we shed the constraint of using synchronous stochastic gradient descent, and we do it asynchronously so that we don't pay the penalty of having to wait for all the workers to be synchronized before we can proceed and compute more gradients. Uh, the workers exchange send up gradient updates, so uh, deltas to the parameter server, the per parameter server does the accumulation and sends back the uh, updated parameters to the workers. So, have we solved the problem? And, and the answer is no by a long shot. That this works extremely well if you have thousands of machines lying around. And um, the efficiency of this system is extremely poor in, if, you co if you consider efficiency, as you know, the amount of gain you gain per additional machine you're throwing into the pool, um, the, the efficiency goes down very quickly. So you, we can get state-of-the-art speed-ups by doing this very, very, very fast training, um, but the, uh, the, the, the efficiency of the whole system is rather poor. Um, it also works well in a setup where you have a, a reasonably low compute density. And by compute density, I mean your networking is fast, but your cores are relatively slow. So if you have a, a data center with fast interconnects between machines, your CPUs are relatively slow, your, your connectivity is good, you can do very well with that. Um, it starts breaking down if you have very high density cores, so like GPUs that are doing a lot of computation very quickly, um, but then because they are GPUs, you, you might have a, an additional penalty in terms of communication with the outside uh, with the rest of the world because your GPU is sitting behind a PCIe bus and there's a lot of complexity involved in making fast communication between GPUs. So this model works well in some environments but breaks down in others. And when you look forward at the future, we really don't really know what the, the data center of the future will look like or the supercomputer of the future will look like. There's a lot of technology that are coming in, you know, into play, uh, you know, faster GPUs, uh, faster CPUs, uh, faster interconnects between GPUs, faster connectivity between machines, and the equation is complete, is constantly changing, and you can't really design a, a training system for one particular generation of your hardware, otherwise you really haven't solved the problem at all, because things are constantly changing. So our goal here is going to be, can we design something that is works in an heterogeneous environment that makes very little assumption about 
the compute density of your system and the topology and, and still um, get, get us as much speed up as we can from parallels. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about from now on is all uh, Alex uh, MC Hammer's work. Uh, this is all the credit goes to him. He has a, a, a um, an archive paper that uh, should be posted uh, shortly uh, on the web that describes this work. So, uh, if you have any questions in particular, you should direct them essentially towards him. Um, so, Alex's ideas is really that um, is realizing that really when you're doing this form of parallelism. Uh, model parallelism versus data parallelism. On one hand, you have data that, um, you know, if you're doing model parallelism, your data gets shipped around the workers, your parameters stay on the same machine. If you're doing data parallelism, your data stays on one machine, but your parameters get sent around different workers. Right? Roughly, that's basically the equation that you have to deal with. So, Alex's idea is, well, let's use model parallelism when it makes sense, and let's use data parallelism when it makes sense. So, model parallelism makes sense if you have very few parameters compared to the number of activations, and that's the case when you have convolutions. On the other hand, um, you can use data parallelism when you have the opposite, when you have uh, basically a large number of parameters, but fewer, relatively speaking, fewer activations per parameter. And so, here's one way it can look like um, on a, a traditional convolutional net. So imagine this is a convolutional net uh, with uh, different layers um, stacked vertically, and you have k workers stacked horizontally. Imagine that you are doing data parallelism in the convolutional layers. So you have each worker treating a separate mini bash of data independently of each other. And then when you get to the fully connected layers, you're going to have model parallelism. So you're going to have chunks of uh, parameters on each of the workers uh, separately, and, the, and data flowing between the workers. So that looks all good. The question is, what happens here? Right? You have this big bottleneck in the middle, where potentially you have to throw between the different workers. All the data has to be shipped around and you have this big synchronization point, this big bubble. Uh, it's indeed the case that if you just wanted to broadcast all the data to everything, you would have very bursty network uh, communication, and you would have to send a lot of data in one shot around and synchronize everything on this big synchronization point. So it's very inefficient. Um, so what if instead of doing that, you actually did a one-to-all broadcast, meaning that each worker at the top of the convolution has basically the activations for the entire rest of the network. So let's have one worker broadcast all its data to the fully connected layers, have the fully connected layers do their work, and in parallel, then you can start sending the data to the fully connected layers for the next mini batch, and actually overlap communication and computation in a very efficient and fine-grained way. So let me uh, ex uh, examine this a bit more graphically. Um, imagine that you have your convolutional networks with three convolutional and two fully connected layer. Um, you have, imagine you have two workers, and so in transit you have two mini dashes at any point in time. In step one, you're going to propagate your data forward through the convolutional layers in parallel, the two separate mini dashes up the uh, network. Um, in step two, you're going to take one of those mini batches and start broadcasting it to the fully connected layers and do the forward pass for those fully connected layers and start the backward pass um, in step three. Then step four, after that, you take the next mini batch and then you do the same thing. Um, it's a little uh, more subtle than this in the sense that step four can actually start while step three is going, while step, or step two and three are, go are going on, because step two and three involve a lot of computation, and while this computation is going, you can actually broadcast the data and saturate the communication link uh, while, the, uh, while the data is flowing. And if you want to be even more sophisticated about this, you can choose to limit and chunk your batch size into smaller chunk even 
to uh, optimize the overlap between the communication and computation for all the different layers. So, just to try and be extra clear about this, what's happening here is you have your, your network, instead of doing the up pass and the down pass on your network, you're going to do up, up, down, up, down, up, down on the fully connected layers, and then down. Right? So every step, instead of being just a one forward and one backward pass, you do up, up, down, up, down, up, down. And hopefully, this way, you can interleave communication and computation and take most of the benefit. Step six, only <coughs> one of the uh, bottom workers? No, all of them. All of them, all of them in parallel, because there are, two, there are now two independent batches that are uh, propagated. But these gradients refer to the output of one of the workers that might be slightly different than the other ones. So you, uh, at the end of the day, you have the gradients from both. And the, you're, you're broadcasting back from the fully connected layers to each of the batches, um, and you're concatenating it into a bigger batch. And so in effect, the convolutional layers are operating on a bigger batch than the fully connected layers. And it works just as well. And you don't need to have a comment. This, this is kind of important to understand things. So if you have any other question on this, um, I know it can be a little confusing. Um, the, the, the bottom line is this works extremely well. So this is a table where um, you, uh, we run experiments with uh, up to eight GPUs. Um, and if you look at what happens uh, for example for four GPUs, we can basically train with a speed up factor of uh, 3.74, uh, which is very close to uh, the, uh, the, the maximum of 4x that you would get. So it, it scales extremely well up to 4. Um, if you go up to 8 uh, GPUs, you get uh, a speed up of 6.32. Uh, keep in mind that when you have 8 GPUs on a TPU machine, you do have a uh, you have to go through the QBI because they are on separate uh, separate PCIe buses. So you incur some bottleneck there. You don't get more. Um, if you compare to uh, there's a paper here that also looks at doing model parallelism and data parallelism at the same time, and they report a 2.2 uh, speed up on four GPUs by doing both at the same time. Um, there is something off in terms of their baseline uh, speed there. It looks like it's off by a factor of two compared to ours, so we have to look at the, the, the details of that. But it scales extremely well, so we can actually build a very large, um, uh, basically distributed GPU computation uh, with very good scale. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talk about um, improving uh, convolutional networks in other ways. I'm going to talk about, uh, depending on time, separable convolutions, fast independent object detection, and then maybe a little bit of uh, video. Um, the, the first uh, piece of work that is, is also a, a, a play on speed, trying to speed up uh, uh, the, 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 the convolutional networks and also make them uh, more compact and, and a better representation of, uh, of data. So this is work by my uh, intern, uh, Laurent Cid. Um So this is not particularly news, but we've, the key idea here is that convolutional filters can be very redundant. If you look at the convolutional filters of, uh, that, that come out of an ImageNet training for RG and B, they look very similar, and so there is a lot of redundancy there. Uh, if you look at the second layer, level of layers, it's also the same. There's a lot of redundancies across the different channels uh, of the filter. And it's been recognized widely. Um, there's a very nice paper that's uh, about predicting parameters in deep learning that uh, takes advantage of this uh, quite well. So I'm going to talk about a much simpler way of taking advantage of this. And uh, it might not get us all the benefits of the full decomposition of uh, filters into uh, trying to make them uh, as parsimonious as possible, but it will get us uh, a large uh, part of the way. And in, in a way, there is some relationships to the work that was built earlier about networking network uh, at, at this conference. So, typical convolution, one way of looking at it is like this. Um, you have a set of input filter uh, maps you have a set of output filter maps, and you're going to convolve a small block over that filter maps. You have a block of uh, a window of W times H, uh, size W times H. You input depth 
what I call to death here is, you know, if you're a, if an image, it's RGB, it's going to be three. If it's uh, the upper layers, it's going to be the number of uh, feature maps that you have. And you have your output depth, which is the number of output feature maps. Okay? Um, here is how a separable convolution works. And the idea here is um, that instead of having a convolution across depth, we're going to take each depth independently, hence the term separable, we're going to take every layer independently, run a convolution over it, and generate dm feature maps. So dm is what we call the depth multiplier here. So it's a tiny convolution with a depth of one going out to basically eight, uh, I say eight because typically eight is the right number, uh, eight filters as an output. So you do that for each depth, and so you're going to concatenate basically all those feature maps into one tall feature map as an intermediate representation of your convolution. And once you've done that, then you are going to project that Separate, those separable filters into the output space by using a simple one-by-one -one convolution, which is basically equivalent to a fully connected net that uh, has shared parameters across the entire feature map. So instead of having W times H times input depth times output depth parameters, you have this depth multiplier, which is a much smaller number, in the middle, and you have extra parameters to uh, basically project back into your output space. So, Let's look at what it looks like in numbers. Imagine you take uh, a, a typical convolutional net, uh, typically, for example, here the uh, Cyber and Fergus architecture for ImageNet. Um, your first layer has an input depth of 3, output depth of 96, uh, the width uh, and height of your patch is 7. Imagine you use a depth multiplier of 4. Um, the number of parameters in your separable convolution is uh, basically a, almost an order of magnitude smaller than what you have in the regular convolution. Um, similar thing for the second layer, you can reduce your number of parameters by between 60 or 80. Does it work? Yes. It actually um, works extremely well at reducing the number of parameters and improving the speed of the system. So you can converge uh, on, on the ImageNet, for example. This will converge about 20% faster in terms of number of steps. Uh, than uh, just using a fully connected uh, convolutional network. Inference is faster, you have fewer parameters to evaluate at every time step. Um, the accuracy is identical, a little better in my experiments, but really I won't make any strong claim without this. But the nice thing is that it's very easy to implement. There is not really uh, much uh, black magic to it. There is no extra parameter except this one that's in the player, which is big. And um, if you have ever tried on uh, uh, on the small tasks, uh, I've tried to make it work on smaller, like C part 10, and none of that uh, really panned out well. So it seems that it's, uh, it works well for large scale things, and not as much on the smaller scale things. Okay, um, I'm wanting to talk about another avenue that I find super interesting. It's the, the, the problem of uh, detection, and uh, the problem of scaling detection to a uh, larger number, large amount of data, and large number of objects. So this is work by my colleagues, uh, Dmitry Wurland, Christian Sechidi, uh, Alexander Toshev, and Robert Um we, We've already seen that convolutional nets for object detection really rule the day right now. And they've really, um, they work extremely well, and they're extremely, uh, they basically set a new baseline in terms of the performance. Um, they're really slow. It's, you, can, you have to really work hard at making them fast and making them uh, computationally efficient. Uh, in the old days, you know, we would use Adapus Cascades for uh, the kind of detection and things like this, and that was a lot more personal use in terms of computation a lot faster. Um, so there is something that needs to be improved there. It's also very difficult to scale them to a large number of detected classes very often what you end up with is something that has to be trained for every single class. Because that's easy with Adebus Cascades? No, it's not. Okay. I'll give you that. Um, the scaling to our number of classes is a problem in general. And I won't make it plain uh, otherwise. Um, so the work that my colleagues did and that is uh, going to be presented 
let's see here, I think the other day, the project is online, was basically addressing this in a very simple way and, and, and looking at it from the perspective of, okay, we are trying to run detection for interesting things. So let's, instead of trying to have a detector per class, let's build a detector which is basically a saliency detector that tries to recognize things um, um, in, in a generic fashion, looking for interesting things to find on images. And let's not actually even use a sliding window to do the detection. Let's use proposals from the convolutional net directly. So you don't have to do any scanning. You can just use the convolutional net features as an output to, to basically generate uh, down the bus proposals. And um, that, you know, given those constraints, given that you're restricting the space of things you can do to a much lower class of complexity, in a sense, you get actually very competitive results on both VOC and, and on, on, on object detection to, to So I think that's a very interesting avenue that you can actually build systems that are have very nice scaling properties and are still state of the art in, in that respect. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about video because I think that's one of the next frontiers. So in video, uh, we don't have a hammer yet. Uh, we don't have the model that really uh, is the right, we believe is the right model or a right model that's competitive for video processing in general. Um, there are lots of questions about how to incorporate uh, this kind of deep learning in, in video. Um, how do you want to just look at single frames independently of each other? Probably not, but it actually works really, really, really well. Um, do you want to do a fusion where you treat frames independently and then you merge the results of the output? Do you want to do early fusion where you put time into the picture and try to uh, do 3D convolution or things? Like or do you want to do a hybrid of those? Uh, and the answer, in my mind, actually, actually is, is that it's, it's not clear yet. There is not really a strong evidence for what's the right way to do this, given the computational constraints we have, given the scale that we need to operate at, and it, it's a really interesting challenge. I think that's uh, one of the next uh, frontiers in terms of ma making uh, video understanding work well. I'll mention though that there is something that interesting that's happening. You know, we've seen that um, the, uh, you know, the the convolutional nets like Alex's net have shown very interesting um, properties in terms of transfer learning, like you train one model and it transfers very well to different tasks. Uh, we're starting to see this in video as well. So this is an experiment that uh, uh, done by some of my colleagues where they train a big a convolutional net on YouTube and uh, try to apply it to the UCF 101 uh, benchmark. And they're able to beat the state of the art by a large margin by just leveraging this information that's been captured by uh, features that were only learned on video uh, from YouTube. So there is, we, we're starting to see this transfer learning happening with some of those models, and I think that's promising. That's, that's something that um, will uh, will be very uh, looking forward in the future. All right, uh, let me conclude. I'll spare that. Um, over and over, we've seen big models plus task-specific transfer learning really work well. And I think that's fascinating to me. Uh, it used to be that machine learning was really, really brittle. And you train on a specific data set or you train the data set for the task that you were looking for. And, uh, and then it worked extremely well on your little data set. And, and as soon as you move to the real world, things didn't work at all. Um, it's very interesting to me that now we're in a regime where models are robust to different data sets, they're robust to different conditions, and can be really, really good state of the art results with transfer learning. Um, it's, it's nice to see, and I think that really tells us that we've moved to something very, uh, to a different regime, and we were, we're getting closer to a model that uh, is really the right approach. Um, I'm still working on computation because I think that's really the bottleneck. Uh, if I could blow up my model by a factor of 10 and just use lots of dropouts, I would do it in heartbeat. But, um, because I think that's where we are going to get a lot more gains out of it. Um, we can't do that right now. We are really limited by computation. And it's really fungible. Performance and computation are really fungible at this moment in time. Um, and maybe, you know, not to say that we, need, we don't need advances in modeling, but computation alone could give us a lot of good benefits for a wide variety of tasks. I think it's a really important uh, area of exploration. 
and uh, we're hiring people to see that. Um, that's pretty much all I had. We have uh, a bunch of uh, interesting papers at IPA that I really uh, recommend you uh, go to the posters and um, talk to the people. I didn't mention any of the work here, but it's all um, really interesting stuff. And that's it. Happy to take questions. Basically, when you have convolutions, uh, convolution layers, data parallelism seems to be the right thing to do. And as soon as you have fully connected model parallelism, it seems to be the right thing to do. And maybe there is going to be a refinement in terms of you can do more, uh, depending on the size of your layers and things like this. But as a rule of thumb, uh, it seems to, to, to be a good starting point. And the interesting thing is that with that approach, you can actually very finely tune by choosing your batch size the ratio of communication to computation to really tailor it to the architecture that you're operating in. And so it's, it's a very simple optimization problem to really to try to hide all the latency, as much of the latency as you can, uh, behind computation and vice versa. That will affect the Sorry? That will affect convergence too. It will affect convergence too uh, because you're changing the batch size effectively. Um, we were surprised to see that we can actually go to very large batch sizes and not really incur uh, any costs. It seems that to be the trend, that there's a, there's a, there are ways to use very large batch sizes in even a stochastic uh, setting and get maximum efficiency. We didn't see any degradation of performance. If anything, it was even better. Um, in the video hammer, you were saying that uh, computation is a bit longer. What is, uh, in your opinion, what is the relative importance of, say, modeling more? Uh, sort of object physics, or having a physics engine, or prior on the dynamics of real world objects. Like how much would that help in the video process? Um, it seems to be that there is a lot of recent work on trying to model the, or, or to approximate or infer the physics of what's happening and getting good results out of that. Uh, um, Jeffrey Hinton would tell you that uh, until machine learning is the the reverse of, com of uh, computer graphics, uh, and we haven't solved machine learning. Um, and there is some some strong evidence that using these kinds of uh, models would actually uh, this kind of inverse learning of the model can actually really help. Um, as soon as you have a huge bottleneck in terms of data compression, uh, you need these very strong models. So you, you presented a slide with convolutional nets for detection, and you said you could infer a window, a bounding box. How do you do that? Uh, I think Christian is in the room, and I should probably answer that question. If you want to talk with him. Uh, there are a few people actually that are here. Okay, so maybe we should do one more question. You said nice to train larger models. Um, you, you can, if you can, I mean, so you, you, you run into all sorts of bottlenecks when you, when you try to build a computer model. But memory on GPUs is becoming a bottleneck rapidly. Um, and, uh, and just your patience waiting for, for the results. Uh, and um, we see, you know, models that train for one per month and keep improving. And even as fast as we can get, uh, it's still forever. You, you can train your models. And whether you'll get an answer, um, uh, you'll get the answer you want, it's not clear because you never reach the Okay, let's okay. thank once more again. All right, so we're now going to have um, four workshop talks.